Hi guys, welcome back. We shall now be talking regarding PEA that is pulseless electrical activity. In this condition, the electrical part of the heart, which is going to be the SA node, the AB node, the bundle of phase and Purkinje is working just fine. But though that particular part of the heart is working just fine, still there is no pulse. So our main priority is to find out what is the cause behind development of pulseless electrical activity because unless and until we find the cause, we will not be able to treat this condition. When I ask in a routine class to my students what is the treatment for pulseless electrical activity, the best treatment, I get answers ranging from DC shock to amidron to uh, epinephrine or soda bicarbonate for this condition. Well, the answer is none of those. We do not shock a pulseless electrical activity. You see, causes of pulseless electrical activity could be ranging from tension pneumothorax to a presence of a cardiac tamponade. So if it's a tamponade, you need to go in for pericardiocentesis. If it's a pneumothorax, you need to go in for a wide bore and needle decompression. So in pulseless electrical activity, you will notice the fact that it is finding the etiology that is very important. Why it is difficult for most doctors to comprehend is because when you read regarding shockable rhythms, non-shockable rhythms and when you are trying to resuscitate a patient, you are giving CPR to the patient, you are all pumped up. In that pumped up situation, your adrenaline is flowing, your neurotransmitters are flowing and you are trying to your best to save the patient. In that, uh, I would say cacophony, in that chaos, our brain does not uh, think about what could be the reasons behind pulseless electrical activity and we might start treating this person as a patient or asystole or we might treat this person as a patient who is having a shockable rhythm whereas pulseless electrical activity, we need to find the etiology and only then it can be corrected. As I said, when we are all pumped up, there might be a possibility that we might have a lack of reasoning for a few seconds or minutes and therefore we may not be able to identify PEA and well the end result is we lose the patient. I have taken this up as a priority topic because when you read about resuscitation, when you read about BLS and ACLS, most people get stuck up at PEA. You see, ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation is easy because obviously you need to provide a DC shock to the patient to reset the rhythm of the heart. If it is asystole, you need to give epinephrine slash adrenaline to the patient. So most people are able to answer treatments for ventricular tachycardia, fibrillation, cardiac arrest. But PEA is where you tend to stuck up or people tend to get stuck up. This is because of the fact that this is a cause specific treatment like I enumerated before you that if person is having pump failure, the pump failure could be due to acute myocardial infarction. Then we have to treat the cause person. Pulses electrical activity could be occurring to from conditions ranging from cardiac tamponade to tension pneumothorax to even hypothermia. In fact, just to get uh, your attention here, I have shown an image from the movie Titanic. You can see uh, Jack and Rose here in uh, uh, the last parts of the movie when Jack is dying in the cold freezing water of the Atlantic Ocean. You will remember in this particular scene that he is totally pale, his mentation is affected, he is not able to recognize Rose properly. You will notice that his lips are turning blue and his heart is gradually slowing down. Hypothermia is also a cause for development of pulses electrical activity. So probably before he expired, he would have had these relatively broad complex QRS complexes. The heart would have gradually slowed down and then it would have converted into a flight line ECG and well, loss of brain circulation would have mean a definitive expiry in the patient. When it comes to outcomes by diagnosis in code blue, code blue implies that there is an emergency protocol instituted in the hospital, then we usually find four rhythms in code blue that are to be remembered by you, which are unstable ventricular tachycardia. Unstable ventricular tachycardia would mean that the patient is pulseless. So we obviously need to provide DC shock to reset the rhythm in the heart. So is the case of ventricular fibrillation. Both of these are called as shockable rhythms and they are in green because the chances of survival of the patient with respect to shockable rhythms will definitely be superior as compared to the inferior to conditions where we do not shock the patient. In pulseless electrical activity, you can see the survival rate is a mere 11%. In asystole, it is a mere 2%. So pulseless electrical activity and asystole is where we do not give shock to the patient. This would be called as a non-shockable rhythm. The mortality rates are definitely higher for the inferior to conditions that I mentioned before. 
so we therefore need to understand why is all this happening i mean we need to understand the cause behind development of pulsus electrical activity to treat it and therefore let's look at a couple of representations so that we can understand this better to find the etiology behind development of pulsus electrical activity one of the causes to be remembered by you is the person could be having a empty heart what i imply by that is that he could have had a bullet injury to his abdomen which could have ripped apart his aorta or superior mesenteric artery or inferior mesenteric artery so in the first diagram i try to show that the person could be having decompensated shock he could be having a hypovolemia and therefore they would be ineffective uh, contractions in a sense that the muscle of the heart is working fine but since the blood has been lost from the body substantially the pulse patient will become pulseless or bpless another cause for this could be that the person has sustained a bullet injury to the chest in this case you can see that the air will rush into the chest of the cavity of the patient and it will cause the pressure in the chest cavity to turn positive this positive pressure will put pressure on this lung it will cause this lung to collapse but apart from this i'm also worried about the fact that this pressure will also cause kinking of the superior vena cava and inferior vena cava you can see that the positive pressure will result in compression of the svc ivc due to kinking of the great veins the venous return to the heart will definitely be compromised and if the venous return is compromised then if input is less output will also be less so therefore another reason why a person could be having the same presentation of pulselessness state is presence of tension pneumothorax why i was emphasizing on pea being important for you to understand or why it is discussed right in the beginning is because this is one part where you have to stop and think and when you are busy doing cpr your adrenaline is so pumped up and you are so pumped up and you are so hell bent on you know doing all those activities like giving adrenaline to the patient or trying to defibrillate a patient that you don't understand that in this condition there is no requirement of defibrillation and obviously you will give cpr to the patient i'm not criticizing that but then cpr is not going to save this patient in a sense that it will just ensure that the person some circulation may be maintained but unless and until you treat the cause in this particular case the survival chances would be close to 0%. In the next condition you can see that the person is having a lot of fluid in the pericardial space and this fluid will be exerting pressure on the heart from outside. The condition that is shown here is by the name of cardiac tamponade. It will crush the heart so badly that the venous return to the heart is compromised and again the output would be reduced. So you can remember the word empty heart which could be hypovolemia, it could be tension hemothorax, it could be cardiac tamponade. In all the three conditions what is basically happening is that input in the heart is getting compromised. If input is less, output will also be less. However, another way to remember why do you get a pulsus electrical activity could be presence of EMD in a patient that is called as electromechanical dissociation. Now what I mean by the word electromechanical dissociation is that this time the electrical part of the heart is perfectly fine again but there is a problem with the muscles. You see in cardiac tamponade per se muscles were fine. It was not that the muscles were not working. The myocardium is working but there is pressure on the heart from outside. That is why the input is less and the output is less. But in electromechanical dissociation the basic problem is that the mechanical part of the heart is not working properly. Now we need to understand what is the problem with the mechanics of the heart. Suppose a person is having coronary artery thrombosis that is myocardial infarction then acute myocardial infarction will contribute to electromechanical dissociation because there would be a stunned myocardium in the patient. Due to hypoxia the myocardium will not be able to function properly if a person is having a massive myocardial infarction mostly an anterior wall extensive anterior wall myocardial infarction due to blockage of the left main coronary artery then the stunned myocardium will not be able to generate a effective contraction and therefore the cardiac output will fall the next cause to be remembered after this could be a development of pulmonary embolism especially in the scenario post delivery like a lady had a, a, a delivered a baby in a hospital and after 24 hours or 48 hours she is having sudden onset respiratory distress. There is a possibility that there could be a development of clots developing in the calf veins of the patient or I can give another scenario a orthopedic implant surgery patient uh, has undergone a, a, a implant surgery like a THR or a TKR and then there is a formation of a thrombus in the leg veins of the patient due to immobilization. This thrombus can then spread retrogradely towards the heart of the patient. The thrombus will go like this. It will enter into the right atria. From right atria, it will go into the right ventricle. Then it will go into the pulmonary artery. 
and then there's a possibility that the embolus could go and it could block the main pulmonary arteries itself. You can see that if the emboli, it could be single, it could be multiple emboli, once they go into the pulmonary artery and they block the circulation, you would be having a severe hypoxia and a ventilation perfusion imbalance and the right side of the heart will definitely fail, will become gradually dilated. So echocardiography will definitely tell you about a failed right ventricle of the patient and in the setting of pregnancy and orthopedic implant surgery, this massive pulmonary embolism as I showed in the previous slide before you could be responsible for development of uh, uh, a pulseless electrical activity in the patient. So if you just get the words empty heart and electromechanical dissociation in your mind, when you are doing CPR in a patient during ACLS protocol, you can definitely try and mentally visualize that either the problem is with the filling of blood in the heart or it could be pneumothorax or it could be pump failure in a patient. So hypoxia is the reason on the right hand side why a person would be having a pulseless and a BP less state. Let us look at the way they teach the same thing to us in a medical college. Like I spoke about an empty heart and electromechanical dissociation, but in college they teach us regarding the 5H and the 5Ts. The 5H, the H would obviously stand for hypoxia. Like in myocardial infarction, uh, there is a hypoxia of the heart, so the pump will not function. Then I have shown hypovolemia, like the aorta of the patient is damaged, that could be secondary to gunshot injury. There is a complete loss of fluid from the body that would contribute to again a pump that will not be able to generate a cardiac output. Then is hydrogen ion, the H obviously because we wanted to create a mnemonic here. So H hydrogen ion excess that would contribute to acidosis and acidosis can again contribute to pump failure. It can damage the heart, it can damage the brain and today we talk about heart per se. So the cardiac activity will be compromised. Please appreciate that in our body, we need optimum temperature of functioning. We need optimum pH. If the pH is distorted, it will result in damage to the heart again. So pump failure can occur. Then is hypo and hyperkalemia. Hyperkalemia is important because electrolyte imbalance hyperkalemia can contribute to diastolic arrest. You can remember like this, calcium causes contraction and potassium causes relaxation. So if potassium is in excess, if potassium is more than 8 milliequivalents, then it can contribute to diastolic arrest in a patient and this would be reason for pulselessness. Hypokalemia not only causes damage to the heart but also creates one more problem for you that is diaphragmatic paralysis. So hypokalemia is having two issues simultaneously. One is cardiac conduction issues which will cause like a prolongation of QT or it might result in a prolonged PR interval. But apart from that, the one of the basic problems in hypokalemia will also be concomitant diaphragmatic paralysis. So there could be a respiratory uh, paralysis and respiratory paralysis will cause hypoxia and hypoxia will cause decreased functioning of the heart. Then last one is hypothermia, a body temperature or core temperature is less than 35 degrees Celsius. We will say that the person is having dangerous hypothermia. So I have shown straight out of movie uh, Titanic about uh, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio who played the role of Jack. He ultimately expired because of the hypothermia component or like a soldier airlifted from Siachen Glacier and uh, yeah, there was an avalanche and the soldier was buried under ice for a couple of hours. He'll end up with hypothermia so we could have a pulseless electrical activity. So we need to rewarm the body of the patient so that the heart activity can become normal. So the five H to be remembered are hypoxia, hypovolemia, then hydrogen ion excess, electrolyte imbalance that is hyper and hyperkalemia and hypothermia in a patient. Then on the five T's the toxins. So toxins could be like the person tried to commit suicide. So it could be like a tricyclic acid, TCA toxicity. So one apart from a person committing suicide and drug overdoses, it could be cardiac tamponade where the venous return of the heart is compromised. Input is less, output is less. So is the case with tension pneumothorax and then two thrombosis are there. It could be pulmonary embolism or it could be myocardial infarction in a patient. So basically there are 5 H and 5 T's which are responsible for PEA and understanding them is of paramount importance because if you are able to identify them, then you are able to treat. Now, because there are so many informations here, total of 10 points, as I said, when you are working in the heat of the movement, you may not be having a brain working fast enough to identify each of the 10 causes. So let's try to simplify this even further of how to remember these 5 H and 5 T's in a much more shorter version so that you can achieve a better prognosis of your patients. So my thought process while I am resuscitating the patient would be like this. One problem could be that the heart is not getting sufficient inflow, that is hypovolemia. Another possibility is that the lungs are not getting sufficient in, that is oxygen. So hypoxia and hypovolemia can be remembered here, two H have been solved. How to remember them? I say that again, heart is not getting enough, lungs are not getting enough. 
so hypovolemia and hypoxia another possibility is that the heart is squeezed from outside or the lungs are squeezed from outside or the heart tissue has died or the lung tissues have died let's practice this i said not getting enough that would mean that there is a severe blood loss in the patient due to maybe a rupture of the aorta following one shot so hypovolemia and the lungs are not getting enough oxygen that would be hypoxia so hypovolemia and hypoxia two can be simply remembered that both are not getting enough so what will you do ration fluids and give oxygen to the patient then is the heart is getting squeezed from outside and the lungs are getting squeezed from outside so heart getting squeezed from outside is the image that i showed you in the previous slide that is cardiac tamponade and the lungs getting squeezed from outside would be by air at positive pressure that is tension pneumothorax another possibility is that the heart is getting killed what i mean by getting killed is there could be acute myocardial infarction of the left main coronary artery or the lung tissue is dying because of massive pulmonary embolism which could result in a palla sign or hampton hump or other aspects which have been discussed in the topic of pulmonary embolism six causes can be simply remembered if you just get these details right that the heart is not getting insufficiently the heart is getting compressed or the heart is getting killed so the important causes of the ones which are remembered here and then we can remember a mnemonic by the name of h e a p heap which will help you remember the remaining ones which are relatively easy and i usually find people not messing up on them because hypothermia is easy to pick up i mean touching the patient you know that is icy cold or like the history is like a soldier was airlifted from siachen glacier but to base hospital chandigarh you are posted there so hypothermia is easy to pick up core temperature less than 35 e would be electrolyte imbalance easy to pick up because most of the time we do abg sample along with electrolytes in all patients undergoing resuscitation so abnormalities of potassium and abnormalities of calcium and sodium can definitely be picked up and mainly it is potassium that is of my concern because especially hyperkalemia can contribute to death of the patient or hypokalemia can contribute to death of the patient and let me say if i have a patient who is a known case of ckd like a diabetic patient who undergoes a dialysis on a recurrent basis in my hospital and today he has come in a pulseless state then i know it could be hyperkalemia right away A would stand for acidosis, which is again easy for most doctors to pick up because the ABG sample will tell you regarding the acidosis component along with the electrolyte report will also come, so it will tell you regarding the potassium derangement. P would stand for poison. If a person has committed suicide, then there would definitely be history present. Like I said, TCA overdose can contribute to a ventricular tachycardia in a patient. So HEAP is something which I usually find that on examination of the patient, from the history of the patient, from the lab reports of the patient, you definitely will get an insight. to but the superior things are important for you to understand because they very manageable right away like if you can put in a wide bore needle to decompress a tension pneumothorax or you can do a pericardiosynthesis or you can thrombolyze a person with acute mi st elevation variety or massive pulmonary embolism then the chances of survival in the patient will definitely increase so interventions for this particular condition will be the ones which are highlighted in this particular slide like one i have shown here a set which is called as a rapid infuser this rapid infuser will also be having a inline warmer it will warm the blood so that you do not have hypothermia because you are aware of the fact that most of the time in cases of trauma if a person is bleeding then trauma causes coagulopathy trauma causes coagulopathy because if you lose blood from the body it results in hypothermia and hypothermia then the blood will not clot and when you will give cold blood to the patient it will worsen the hypothermia of the patient so therefore when you are using a rapid infuser in the patient it can give fluids it can give blood transfusion and you can obviously have a inline warmer here also which will ensure that the hypothermia component can be managed in the patient so here i have tried to show you a rapid infuser which will do two things that is one take care of hypovolemia and second manage the hypothermia of the patient as well on the other hand i have also shown here before you a zephy sternum guided or a, an echocardiographic guided pericardiosynthesis that will take care of cardiac tamponade where the compression of the chambers of the heart will reduce the input and the output similarly if a soldier is having a bullet injury then a wide bore needle in the second intercostal space I have had messages saying that now it is changed to fifth intercostal space. Well, Harrison has not changed it. It is still wide bore needle in the second intercostal space for management of tension pneumothorax in a patient. Where do you answer fifth intercostal space? You can just listen to me here. If the soldier is having a bulletproof vest in place, 
if the soldier is having a bulletproof vest in place then obviously you cannot put a needle through the bulletproof vest so you will raise the arm of the soldier and you will insert the needle because on the side there is no bulletproof vest bulletproof vest is in front and back because the soldier has to do running also so on the side in the fifth intercostal space in the mid axillary then you can put in a needle in the patient so only if there is a bulletproof vest in situ that you use the fifth intercostal space or if you have a male with big pectoral muscles like uh, like a soldier you know with, because they do regular push ups and sit ups and exercise he might be having big pectoral muscles so then the needle may not reach into the pleural space you may not be able to decompress the pleural space so answer fifth intercostal space only in cases of males with big pectoral muscles or a bulletproof vest in situ otherwise it is still a wide bore needle in the second intercostal space and for hypothermia in the patient you will have a blower which is available so we are having a special blanket this uh, special air blanket with a blower will treat care of the dangerous hypothermia in the patient because hypothermia versus the coagulopathy component and apart from that slows down the heart also so if all these maneuvers are done then the chances of survival of the patient will increase to close to 11% right that is what i said initially that in spite of all the hard work that we have done the survival chances of pulses electrical activity is only close to 11% not because it is per se dangerous i'll say the problem with pulses electrical activity is that we are not able to institute steps for improvement of conditions causing a pulsus electrical activity you see all the remaining conditions like vt ventricular fibrillation treatment is cardioversion ace historiogram epinephrine so the remaining conditions are amenable to single or two steps or three steps but for pulsus electrical activity first you need to analyze and once you analyze then you have to take steps to take care of that problem that takes time and in the heat of the movement lots of time we may not be able to pick uh, pick up the treatment part for pulses electrical activity which explains the high level of mortality for this condition so these are the aspects for pea that you need to remember especially the causes that i have enumerated before you and if you just get these words right empty heart and electromechanical dissociation you would be able to get a better insight into this topic if you want to remember it the routine medical college way the 5h and the 5t's that is fine by me and let's put it practically because there are 10 causes there we need to simplify so it is like not enough the heart is squeezed or the heart is killed i repeat again heart is not getting in lungs are not getting in that would be hypovolemia hypoxia squeezed from outside that could be cardiac tamponade and tension in thorax the heart is killed the lungs are killed that is pulmonary embolism and myocardial infarction so you would be able to do a faster intervention if you try to follow this particular side of mind and then obviously remedial action would be to obviously institute steps so that the management of these patients is important remember my words for pulses electrical activity first step is obviously cpr you need to give chest compressions and rescue breaths in ratio 3 is to 2 but next he says in the protocol identify the reversible causes that part of the resuscitation protocol is usually neglected by us identify the reversible causes because all everything else is one step or two step treatment but identify reversible causes are the ones which we are discussing here and if you are able to do this then you will upgrade the survival chances of your patients and therefore the success rate when you are running emergency services in a hospital will definitely improve thank you so much for listening